Welcome. Glad you're here today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just excited to be able to gather, uh, although it's not ideal, just excited to be able to gather together again and, and, and come in and, you know, praise and worship the Lord, uh, receive his word, and just allow him to do a great work in us. So I'm going to get right into it this morning. We're in a series we're calling, Now What? What Now? And we're trying to help answer the questions about how we progress through the process of our faith. Again, our key verse for this series comes from Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Or the message version, it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying purifying process. So, my hope is as we go through this series, as we navigate the ins and outs of it, as we try to figure out now what, what now of our faith, it'll help to serve as a guide for each of you, regardless of where you are in your relationship with Jesus. Again, I want to remind you, each of you is in a unique walk. Your salvation experience is personal, and your process is personal. Remember, it's not private, but it is personal. And so regardless of where you are in your faith journey, everything we talk about in this series will still pertain to and be relative to you. Now, there's nothing about faith, nothing at all about faith that's too basic. And there's nothing about faith that's too unattainable. And as you walk your walk, you'll find that, sure, at this point, I'm thinking, man, that's just, I can't see myself there. I can't, I just don't know. And that's okay, because God will get you there. But hopefully, you're not at a place in your walk where you're going, well, yeah, I can tune this out. I don't need to hear this or that. I don't need to pay attention to this thing or that thing. Uh, it's just too too mundane, too elementary for me. I, I really hope that you continue when you look at God's word, when you hear God's word, that you take the opportunity to allow God's word to speak to you where you are. Because I got to tell you, throughout my walk, as I've progressed through the process, throughout my walk, I have, I know I've read the same passages several times over and over again. I got to tell you, at some point in my walk, either it, you know, it was just good reading or it meant something else and then I got to a certain place and it applied differently. Not that the word changes, but how God can apply it in our lives. That's the key we need to understand as we're walking this walk. So nothing's too basic and nothing's too unattainable. So I want to remind each of us that wherever we are in our walk, you know, if you're a brand new person, uh, to the faith, new to the faith journey, be patient. Let the Holy Spirit do his thing. All right? Remember, you have a new operating system. All right? And, and, and I'm trying to help those of you who have been walking the walk for a while or have been, you know, doing this a while that, that maybe um, find ourselves sometimes in, in a, a place of, of familiarity and varying levels of complacency have kind of kicked in and, 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 you know, whether we realize it or not, we found that we've kind of stagnated a little bit. See, I want you to remember that progress is a process. And the only way to stop the progress is if you allow the process to stop or, be called, or become stalled or stunted. All right? That takes time. I know. We don't like that these days, right? We live in that instant now, boom, boom, boom world, right? You know, the drive through the, even though the drive throughs aren't very instant these days, are they? I mean, I don't know if y'all been to one lately, but you go in there and it's not quite as quick as it used to be. But, you know, we, we got our handhelds and, and, and all our digital stuff and, and we're so used to instant, though that's even seemed to slow down some with all the internet traffic going on these days too, so... But learning this faith walk, walking this walk, growing and experiencing all that God has for us takes time. It takes time to start changing how you think, how you talk, how you act, and, and, and what you do. 
Don't make the Christian life too complicated. God will lead you and reveal his call on your life. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. But really, it's a walk with God. And not one of them crazy power walks, you know. Woo! Nah, it's just kind of a leisurely stroll with God in the garden like he used to do with Adam and Eve. It's a nice, brisk day where God's just kind of joining you in your life. And every day is like that. Colossians 2, 6-7 through 7 tells us, says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. See, those roots, those roots are established along the way through prayer, the reading of God's word, the, the Bible, Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and direct you and being in fellowship and discipleship with other believers. So, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. You know, and <clears throat> one, of, one of our traditions as a family is that we get together on Saturday night before Easter and we dye Easter eggs. Well, I guess they're not really Easter eggs until you dye them. They're just kind of white eggs in a carton. So, yeah, we don't dye. It's kind of like saying we dye Easter eggs. It's kind of like saying hot water heater. Okay, sorry. Lost myself there for a minute. Anyway, maybe you all have a similar tradition as well. Maybe uh, you get together as a family. Maybe you have some snacks, or maybe you do some things. You, you get together with the kids or grandkids. You, you color eggs. You, you have a good time. See, for us, we enjoy it because it's a time our family can come together, right? We can kind of join together. We can kind of have a good time, get a little messy, um, though we do lay out all kinds of paper and stuff on the table because y'all met Myla. <laughs> Love you, bug. Um, but... <laughs> We, you know, it's a good time for us. We, we enjoy it. Now, when it comes to dyeing the eggs, we all have different things we like to do. You know, because we're all unique in our own way. We like to do things in a unique way. Like, Jeannie, Jeannie likes to kind of do the, the tie-dye look on the eggs. And she's really good at it. I mean, if I try to do that. Oh, Brian's giving me the thumbs up. I think he likes the tie-dye stuff too. Yeah. See? And, but she's right, like, if I tried to do it, man, I, I, I don't know. It would just look like some kind of, I don't know, bad Picasso or something. Um, is there a good Picasso? I don't know. I guess art critics will tell me, yes, there is. But anyway, so, yeah, that's her thing. She likes to kind of play around with it and see how she can, you know. And, and, and I mean, she doesn't do it. She, like, she does it by hand. She kind of takes in each different way, and it comes out really cool. Myla, Myla likes to have at least one purple egg. Myla's got to have a purple egg. It doesn't matter what else she does, she has to have that one purple egg. All right? Brian, give me the thumbs up on that one too. Myla, you have a big fan, and Jeannie, you have a big fan in Brian here. All right? But then after that, Myla just kind of gets creative with, with the others, trying to do multicolor, multi shade eggs, and, you know, she just kind of has a good time with it. Me? I like mine to just sit in the color as long as possible and get the deepest, darkest, you know, most vibrant color out there. And you know what I found, and I just found this out recently, like, you get a better color if you use actual food coloring than the little dye tabs. Yeah, it's really cool. So maybe we'll do that next year instead of spending money on dye tabs. Um, although a couple years ago, like, Walmart had this big sale and we got, like, a bunch of those kits for like 50 cents a piece or 25 cents a dozen or some crazy thing like that. So we got several of them still left over. Um, but yeah, I just kind of like leave mine laying in there. Um, but usually I like to get that, the last egg, my last egg, and I just kind of like wait till everybody's done and I'll like let it lay in every color for a little bit and get that real gnarly looking, you know, freaky looking color on it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. But Ashley, Ashley is very particular about how she does her eggs. 
it's, you know, it hadn't always been that way just in the last several years. I don't know if any of y'all ever saw Ice Age Dawn of the Dinosaurs, all right? But since then, Ashley has had a specific way she wants to do her eggs. She needs to have at least three eggs. And then what she'll do, she'll get in there, she'll go, and then like, I, usually it's like one's orange, another one's green, she likes green. Um, and then the other one, she'll, I, whatever, color, here and there. But it's not the color. What she does is she'll take a little wax pencil, she'll draw the faces and stuff on them, right, and then dip them in there. And then when they come out, she names them uh, Egbert, Shelly, and Yoko. After, the, after how Sid named the eggs that he found in that movie. Now, the funny thing is, this year, she got the color in them, and she was on, and she forgot. She goes, oh, no, I forgot to do it. So what she did, she just grabbed the eggs when they were done and grabbed the pencil and drew on it. And I got to tell you, it looked more like Sid's eggs this year than it has in the past because she had the pencil marks on there. So <laughs> really cool. Really cool. Um, but it's, we just had a good time coloring the eggs. And, you know, I... Eggs, they, they're, they're really cool, they're, you know, they're fun, they're, they're good to eat. I mean, I like eggs. You just get like the five dozen bag uh, box from Walmart. Um, but this is, you know, colored egg and, you know, sorry, I didn't have dinner. Brian kept me going for a while. Hope y'all don't mind. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I like how, you know, you get a little dying, it ain't gonna hurt you, but they, they it's so easy, or relatively easy, to peel these things. They're just, you know, just comes right off, right? And, oh, look at that. That's cool. Now, that's pretty cool. It went all the way through to the egg, but sorry, I'm going to close. This is what I do. I like eating. Sorry about that. Not really, but. So, they, you know, coloring them. We transformed the outside and made it so easy to peel on the inside. So I'm just gonna kind of peel the other ones, get a head start so I can kind of walk back and forth. And yes, I'm probably gonna snack while I talk. But you know, we wanna, oh, what the, oh, oh, uh-oh. Oh my, that's um, that's unfortunate. What happened? Wow. Hmm. That, okay, I, that was interesting. Huh. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but I can tell you, I think what we learned there is it just because something looks different on the outside? Doesn't necessarily mean it is different on the inside. See, if we're not allowing God, through his Holy Spirit, to transform us inside, then when the outer layer cracks, chips, breaks, will ooze out just like the contents of that egg. There'll be no substance and will only appear different on the outside. See, both these eggs, they look similar before we cracked them, right? In size, texture, color, they were very similar. Both were changed on the outside and looked different. But someone forgot the most important part about the process. While things appeared to be changed, one of them was never transformed. So today, for the second part of our Now What, What Now series, I'm calling this message Inside Outside. And there's some real keys here that I want us to see as we go through this today. And again, this is for everyone. This is for anyone and not just a new believer. Ideally, what we do will change as we begin our new transformation in Christ. But outward change is only superficial. 
outward change is not long, long standing if we aren't first transformed from within. I mean, we can keep all the rules, do the right things, look the part, but if we have not experienced heart change, then we're only a facade, we're a false front. We may look good on the outside, but inside we're an ooey, gooey mess. Look at that, ah, that's nasty. See, it didn't matter that the once white egg was now a blue one, or even that it resembled the other egg. Unless the egg was transformed from within, it really wasn't any different, and it collapsed under the pressure instead of being firm and solid. A lot of us are like that. Either we think, our, either we think ourselves that it's all about the external and, and, and try to change appearance, how we dress, the music we listen to, the TV or movies we, we watch, the habits and hang-ups, and on and on and on and on. We want to fit the mold. Right? We want to show that we get it. We either mistakenly believe ourselves or we are somehow mistakenly led to believe by others that this is how a good Christian should look. How a good Christian should act. How a good Christian should feel. And very quickly, we find ourselves discouraged because it doesn't seem lasting or to measure up to others. Stop. Stop believing that. Stop hearing that. Stop receiving that because it's a process of progress. Nobody got to where they are without God doing some reno work inside them first. And sometimes, most times, the person or people don't have it any more together than you do. It's just different. See, comparison is a killer. Comparison is what the enemy uses to discourage and keep us from pressing on. Believe me when I tell you this. Me and comparison, we go head to head almost on a regular basis. I got to fight that monster quite often. See, because I look, oh, well, this guy does it this way. This guy preaches like this, or that guy preaches like that, or, or uh, now that we're online, oh, look how many views this guy got, and how many we got, and oh my gosh, how many of this and that. It's just an ongoing process, and if I'm not careful, it will destroy everything that God has done in me and brought me to this far. See, comparison is not an honest assessment of where you are or, or where you're headed. It's not an honest barometer of who you are or who you're becoming. Remember, I said last week that salvation is personal. It doesn't look or track exactly the same for everyone. Don't allow what you feel. Remember, it's got to be more than feeling. Don't allow what you feel to deter you from what God has already accomplished. Somebody give me an amen out there online. Give me that check. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. But see, then there's those, you know, our well-meaning Christians that expect others to immediately, instantly, and resoundingly change the second they accept Jesus. You know, they're the ones that are like, they're like, well, they, they raised their hand last week. They was at the altar and given. Well, they ain't no different. You know, these folks decide for others how they should dress the music they should listen to, the TV movies they should watch, the habits and hang-ups that hang them, the habits that hang them up, and on and on and on. You know the type. You've seen them. You've probably met them. You've probably sat next to them in a service before, running to them out on the street. The ever-present, all-showing saints of the sanctuaries who believe it's somehow their responsibility to school everyone on the proper Christian etiquette. You know, the ones who have a whole lot to say, yet no one can ever quite figure out what it is they do? You know, the ones who can talk a blue streak, but you never actually see them doing anything except for showing up and spouting off. And somehow, because they've been a fixture as long as the building's been around, they think somehow they have an inside track 
to gauge everyone's walk. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about the folks that are actually attempting to honestly and, and wholeheartedly and, 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 and in love actually disciple someone and help them. No, I'm talking about the self-righteous, judgmental folks who only have criticism or friendly suggestions to offer. See, these are the whispers, the gossipers. Well, I saw his car parked out over there by the bar late last night. How do you know, out of curious, how do you know his car just didn't break down and that's the closest place he could get to get it off the road? And by the way, what exactly were you doing out that late and by the bar of all places? Oh, I can't believe that, you know, that, 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 that church puts out butt cans for people. That, that they shouldn't condone smoking. They shouldn't invite people to smoke on their place. No, churches aren't doing that because they condone that. But they're, they're, they're not judging people who do. They're giving them the opportunity to move forward. But hey, thank you for volunteering to walk the campus and pick up the cigarette butts that are unbearably beyond the ground because there's no butt cans. Oh, I can't believe what she wore to church. Did you see that? I mean, really? Hey, maybe that's all she's got. Maybe she has nothing else right now. And if it really concerns you that much, I don't know, maybe instead of being judgmental and pointing your finger and talking about her behind her back, maybe you could politely offer her a gift card. And maybe she'll go buy herself some new clothes, some different clothes. But when you do that, do it with no strings. See, Jesus talked about this. He talked about us, you know, deciding for others who they should be, where they should be, and how they should be. He said, it's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and, and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this I know better than you mentality and playing a holier than thou part instead of just living on your own part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. See, when we focus all of our energies and all of our attentions on what's going on outside a person or ourselves, we don't emphasize enough what God needs to do on the inside. And you know what happens almost every time? They leave. No, it's but not because they were never saved in the first place. It's because someone has shown them a superficial Christianity that has no depth, no root. And they figure, if that's all there is, man, I'll just run down to Barnes & Noble and pick me up, you know, a couple books off the many, 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 many racks of the self-help aisle. Because I don't need all the looks, sneers, and well-meaning suggestions. A lot of y'all who know me know that Casting Crown is one of my favorite groups. Love Casting Crown. Matter of fact, back in the day, uh, I, I used to uh, work uh, some concerts. Uh, a friend of mine was had a the, knew the person who ran DC Promotions, and he he got me to come along and help set up tear down for the concerts and stuff. And one of the first concerts I worked was Casting Crowns. We got to meet Mark Hall and and the rest of the group. And man, super cool folks, man, super cool. But one of my favorite songs of theirs is called "What This World Needs." You know, and it talks about, you know, that we need a savior who will love us, uh, you know, one who will, who will walk with us and forgive us. And there's a part in the song that I really want to key in because it's really pertinent to, to what we're talking about today. There's a part in the song where, where, he, where they sing, what this world needs is for us to care more about the inside than the outside. Have we become so blind that we can't see God's got to change their heart before he changes their shirt? You see, it doesn't matter 
what's going on on the outside unless God is allowed to work on the inside. Now, that person who's wrestling with drugs may be a pastor by the time God's done with them. Hello? Yeah. Right here. If y'all would have met me 20 years ago, what? Maybe that person who's still living in this twisted wreck of their dysfunctional family may be a great missionary someday. Maybe that person who's, who's shacked up the first time they pray the sinner's prayer may turn out to be the person who reaches dozens, of, dozens more in their family or leads a family ministry. If you think They'll always be an inferior brand of Christian because of their background. You're flat wrong. If you think because of your background you will always be an inferior brain of Christian, you've got it wrong. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter. God has worked with some really twisted folks and turned them into some really awesome, awesome people for his cause. Paul. I mean, we, we keep coming back to Paul. We use Paul a lot because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But this guy was killing Christians, man. He was out hunting them down, killing them. God used him. Turned him around. Changed what was on the inside so that outwardly he could do God's work. So I'm telling you, no one is outside of God's reach. And I'm talking to every one of you out there who are looking at this screen right now. If you believe that right now, give God a praise in our chat. Because I'm telling you, God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. God can use you if you'll allow yourself to be used by him. So my point is, remember, every individual is unique. They have unique experiences, unique circumstances, and unique adversity. And rather than judging them, how about we love them? Do not save them as an attempt to clone yourself and your Christian experience. Which, by the way, you can't save them anyway. See, if we don't allow the lordship of Jesus to lead our lives, we will remain stuck in the place or places... We are. If the Holy Spirit is not allowed to direct our paths, we will always be walking down an overgrown, overgrown uh, unclear, twisty, turny path rather than the one that he's laid out for us that is made straight. If we don't allow the inner transformation, then everything we do on the outside will only be to serve a selfish purpose leading people to us rather than to the cross, to Jesus. It will be for glorifying ourselves rather than glorifying God. If we fail to submit to the authority God has planted over us, whether in a worldly setting or from a spiritual standpoint, there will always be contention, always be divisiveness, always be chaos and confusion. If we choose that way, if we choose that our way is better than the way, we will never be able to see others and their needs, and everything good we do will only be really to serve other, to serve ourselves, our own self-interest, and what we want to do. You know, just in case y'all aren't aware of this, Jeannie is amazing. Jeannie's like my inspiration. I gotta tell you, I mean, Jesus is my hero, but Jeannie's my inspiration. Ever since I came to Christ and before, when I didn't know it, I was learning from her. She was my example. She was where I saw faith in action. But she taught me a saying years ago, and, and I've used it in, I don't know, Countless sermons. I don't even know how many times I've used it in sermons and conversations with people, uh, wherever. But it's one of my favorite sayings, and I'm going to share it with you 
maybe for the first time, maybe again. But there's a question that she posed that it's kind of an amazing evaluation tool of what we're doing or who we're doing it for and whose purpose we're serving. It goes, are you doing what you think you should be doing for God? Or are you doing what God has called you to? I'm going to say it again. I know Brian had it on the bottom of the screen, but I'm going to say it again. Are you doing what you think you should be doing for God? Or are you doing what God has called you to? Now, see, on the surface, it seems like it's the same question. It seems like, oh, I don't, yeah, huh? I don't give a, that doesn't make sense. Why would you think that's so amazing? And I, look at the question. Because most people get tripped up here. See, it's not about what he's called you to do, but what, who, he's called you to be, which will instinctively lead to the do. And the key in there is, are you doing what you think? Or are you doing what God has? And that's where the difference lies. See, we get so focused on the doing, the doing, the doing, that we forget about the, or outright ignore, the being. God is more concerned about who you are than what you do. Again, let's go back to the, the Mark Hall quote from the Cassie Crown song. You know, he's got to change your heart before he changes the shirt. He's more concerned about who you are than what you do. See, what you do will be a direct reflection of who you are. Jesus tells us that from the, from the mouth flows what is in the heart. In other words, if you're not directed by righteousness from within, how can you possibly profess or do on the outside what is righteous? What we do will always reflect who we are. See, our outside actions will always reflect our inside nature. Our outside actions will always reflect our inside nature. Jesus said, and they will be known by their fruit. Meaning that what you do will be a reflection of who you are. And just because it looks good on the outside doesn't mean it is on the inside. Don't worry, I ain't gonna spill it, Michelle. It's all good. We can claim to be doing things for, things for God that have absolutely nothing to do with what God has called us to. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, say they, 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 were, they were the religious leaders of the day in Jesus' day. By all appearances, they were doing the right things. They looked real good on the outside. They said the right things. They went through the right rituals. They did all the, you know, things that people were supposed to do. Yeah, they were righteous on the outside, but the same couldn't be said for what was inside. Check out how Jesus addresses them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup of the di and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup of and the dish, so that the outside may become clean also. But he's not done there. <laughs> he comes on and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but in, inwardly are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Ouch. Oof. 
Man, that's rough. That's pretty rough. But it's true. Jesus, see, Jesus, it may seem like Jesus was just kind of calling them out. And he was, because they were supposed to be who was leading everybody. And they were misleading everybody. But at the same time, he was showing us, he says, look, don't worry about the outside. The outside will come after the inside. If the inside is not clean, if the inside is not righteous and, and, and holy and, and, and pleasing and pleasant, the outside won't be either. It's like I could have, I could have a wall full of mold and I can paint some paint over it and it's going to look good for a few, for a little bit, for a while. But you know what's going to happen eventually? That stuff's going to bleed through and the mold's going to come back out. And you see, the same way with us, we can all, we can dress it up on the outside, right? We can make it look nice and pretty on the outside, but eventually what's inside will come out. It will come to the foreground. It will present itself. See, we misinterpret Jesus, when he says, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. Or when James talks about faith and deeds, we think it's about the doing, when really it's about the being. Isaiah says, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous actions are like filthy rags. We all shriveled up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And Paul says, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is not there is no one who has understanding. See, on our own, there is no righteousness. There is no righteousness in us on our own. So then how can we possibly do anything right? How can we live a righteous life on our own? We can't. The only way we can follow his commands and show our faith through what we do is if we first have allowed the Holy Spirit to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Somebody give me an amen. Come on. I'm going to assume you did. The only way we can do those things is to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to place us in the will of God. See, we can only be accepted before God by faith in Jesus. And we can only please God with our lives when we live according to his Holy Spirit. See, we can't please God in and of ourselves. When God, by his grace and by the virtue of Christ and his sacrifice, bestows on us his gift of forgiveness on those who obey, then God has made them righteous. And then, and then our outside will begin to reflect an image of the transformation on the inside. And our actions will resemble a new and righteous heart. And our deeds will be wrapped in righteousness, not because we are righteous, but because of the righteousness from within that is the Holy Spirit. God is giving you a new life in Christ through the Spirit. And God says in Ezekiel, one of his promises, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. See, there's nothing in there that says we can or have to do it. On our own. And everything in there that says, I, God, will move these things. I, God, will transform these things. I, God, will take you from where you are to where you need to be. I, God, will take you from where you are to where you can be. We're a new creation in Christ. The old is, is gone and the new has come. You are no longer who you were. I don't care where you are in your walk. I want you right now to claim that. You are no longer who you were, whether you just gave your life to Christ five minutes ago or whether you've been a Christian for 20, 30 years, you're still. No, 
You're no longer where you once were. You're no, you no longer stand apart from Christ. You are now invited into living by the power of the Holy Spirit, a righteous, a holy, a pleasing to God kind of life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you've been given the power of a new spiritual life to renew your mind, transform you to be more like Jesus. Woo! Also, Whitney, the warning. Is the Christian life hard? Nah, it's not hard. It's impossible. That is, it's impossible to live on your own. With man, this is impossible. See, you cannot save yourself, and you cannot live the Christian life by yourself either. God knows you could never live it by yourself. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit. With God, all things are possible. Jesus said, I have to go so that I can send the counselor, the helper, to lead you through. Too many people try to please God through their own efforts. We fail again and again and again when we try to do things on our own, but God. There it is again, but God. But God has given us the precious gift of his Holy Spirit so that we, we can be changed and that change can happen from the inside outside. Let God, through his Holy Spirit, do his work. Don't listen to the voices outside that are telling you you aren't who God says you are. Don't listen to the voices inside that tell you you can't be who God wants you to be. Because God says, I have given you a new heart and put my spirit in you. Let God do his work. Let God transform you from the inside out. Because outside, if you are just Dying yourself. Inside. You'll be a mess. Real change. Real growth. Happens. From the inside. Outside. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we do not become like the world. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may learn to understand your will for our lives, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I thank you for our continued spiritual growth and, and transformation. Help us to focus on the godly values and ethical attitudes that will help us to flourish spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Holy Spirit, guide us as we Look not to the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are seen are, are, are not seen are eternal. Be with us. Give us advice. Make us come alive in you. Lord, we know, how trans we know transformation may not happen overnight. Give us the patience, the strength, and the peace to wait upon you as you continue this process within us over time. We are made new because of you. Thank you because anyone rooted in you is a new creation. We give you all the glory, Lord, because all things have passed away. Our old moral and spiritual condition no longer exists, and all things have been refreshed and have become new by your grace and divine nature. I am convinced and I am confident that he who has begun a good work in us will continue to perfect and complete it until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Father, your word offers us hope that we'll continually be transformed and spiritually have, transformed spiritually because you want us to be complete and sanctified through you. I pray that we will never become stagnant, that we will continue to grow, and we thank you in advance for our continued, ongoing transformation. I declare that transformation in our lives has begun. Your love will shine through us so that others will see you within us 
wherever we go and in everything we do. In Jesus' mighty, precious, and holy name we pray. Amen. Woo! Man, that was fun. I tell you, cracking some eggs, making a mess. But all the mess is contained. Don't worry about it. No mess up here. No mess anywhere. Hey, real quick. Well, not real quick. Because this is the most important part of the, of the whole worship experience. And we've had some worship music. We've had God's word. We've had some prayer. And now, now comes the time, if you have never been given the opportunity, or if you have never actually felt led at a moment to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here's your chance. In just a minute, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. This prayer doesn't save you. It's not some magic hocus pocus one, two, three spell. What this prayer does is it opens you up for God to move in, for his Holy Spirit to move in and begin the work we've talked about here today. Now, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. As soon as I said it, you know, there's going to see a little icon come up. If you're with us in the online church, it's, you know, salvation says, give my life to Jesus. If you click that button, let us know. Don't stop there with the click of that button, though, because we don't know who does that. And we would love to celebrate with you or at least help you figure out what the next steps are in this amazing journey that you've just embarked on. So that will open up a little window. Just give us a little information about you so we know how to reach out to you, so we know how to pray for you, so we know how to, I don't know, come alongside you. Because that's what this is all about, coming alongside one another, leading one another, helping other, each other walk this walk. Because we're not in it alone. Yeah, our salvation may be personal, but it's not private. We were designed to be in community. And that doesn't mean if we're in a physical, that doesn't only mean a physical gathering, though, man, I cannot wait for that to happen again. But that all, that means in, in, in a community form where we can reach out and check on each other, be accountable to one another. You know, Brian and I are always talking back and forth throughout the week. I'm talking to different folks throughout the week saying, hey, how you doing? Praying for you this time. And we want to be able to do that with you. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity, lead you in a prayer now that's going to help open your heart and ask him to move in. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Take my sins. Take my brokenness. Take my hurt, my bitterness, my pain. Come into my heart and life. Thank you for forgiving my sins, for healing my hurts, for giving me eternal life. I want to trust and follow you. Come into my heart and my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you said that prayer, we rejoice with you today. If you said that prayer and you, and, and you said it in full arms and you invited Jesus into your heart, the angels in heaven celebrate. But like I said, that doesn't save you. That leads you to the place. And we're going to keep talking about that over the next couple weeks about, you know, what now? Uh, now what? What now? You know, and, and, and what the steps and processes are. So I'm so glad you're here with us. And I, and I look forward to us coming back together again next week as we follow this up. Until then, Jeannie and I love you guys. Well, we're praying for you. We miss you. We can't wait to see all of you again. And we just pray that God will lay a mighty blessing on each of you and your households and your families and your businesses and, and your lives. And that you will be a blessing as you are blessed. God bless. Have a great week. See you next time.